Welcome to episode 65 of the GT on 5G. It's the latest inside scoop on everything 5G. We cover six topics in about 15 minutes, and it's brought to you by More Insights and Strategy. I'm Will Townsend, and joining me again this week is fellow analyst Anshul Sag. Let's get started. So my first topic this week is around the big 5G event that took place in Denver. Um, this was my first live event uh, post-COVID, if we can even say that, with Delta going on right now. But um, just wanted to share a few insights. By the way, if you want to hit my Twitter feed at Willtown Tech, I was live tweeting um, during the entire conference. But at a high level, you know, I give light reading kudos for pushing forward with a hybrid event. Attendance was very light. And in fact, on the first day of keynotes, half of the keynotes were virtual, including Neville Ray with T-Mobile. But with all of that said, there were some interesting uh, discussions there. The first day was centered on 6G, and you and I have talked about that, buddy, in the past. Um, I kind of felt like, you know, there wasn't a lot of substance there. Um, you know, I saw Sean Kenny from RCR Wireless, and he agreed. But hey, you know, folks are wanting to put a, you know, kind of a stake in the ground there, so I, I give them credit. But on the second and third days, there were a number of breakouts and presentations. Uh, 5G America's Chris Pearson spoke, and uh, that was interesting, sort of talking about the momentum with the deployment of uh, 5G, and uh, also hosted a panel where um, there was discussions around use cases and those sorts of things. And again, tune into my Twitter feed for additional, you know, um, insight there. Probably, you know, one of my bigger takeaways was I'm impressed with Cradle Point. Now, um, as most folks know, Ericsson acquired Cradle Point. And at first, I was really inquisitive about that. It's like, you know, what will Cradle Point bring to, to Ericsson? And it became clear to me, I met with the CMO, Todd, and I'm going to butcher his last name. It starts with a K, so apologies, Todd, if you're listening today. But he and I had a great one-on-one uh, -on -one towards the end of the event. And really, I think where they're focused is... Um, taking, taking the portfolio that Ericsson has traditionally obviously uh, brought to the service pro provider community and extending that into enterprise. And, you know, Cradle Point is a solution that you may not be aware of, but you probably interact with on a daily basis. And they have, you mentioned a retail location like Starbucks and I believe Target, um, even Redbox, those kiosks where, you know, if you're still running movies, um, you know, they power those solutions as well. And so, you know, as I sort of look at it, um, and, and they've been investing in 5G for quite some time, so they feel like they have a lead um, over their competition. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, with Cradle Point and Ericsson coming together, they could make a nice run at the enterprise. So I know, Angel, you were at an event uh, with Qualcomm in New York, but um, did you catch any of the news coming out of Big 5G? I did. Um, I, I saw your panel. Um, I think there was one about cybersecurity as well. Yeah, we talked um, about uh, security and 5G and thanks for mentioning yeah. that. that. That was a spirited debate. We, we had sort of a conspiracy theorist jump into the Q&A at the end, but that, that video, yeah, that video will be available um, either on the Informa website or Huawei sponsored that one. So it might be something that Huawei shares, but yeah. so. I think uh, I think part of the reason why attendance was light um, was because um, I I don't believe that they were requiring masks. Um, Correct. And I'm not sure were they requiring vaccinations as well. No, they weren't. So no proof of vaccination, no mask requirement. Yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah. I think that probably was the reason why a lot of people didn't attend. Yeah. Um, I know myself. I wouldn't have gone if that wasn't a requirement, which is why I did go to the other event because it was. Sure. Um, but I, I think that's gonna, it's gonna be a good test case for um, these kinds of events in the future. Um, and I do think it's, it's um, interesting that they led with 6G um, because like you said, it's, it's a very light, it's not very um, substantive right now. It can't right. be. So yeah. um, I think it's um, interesting to lead with 6G, but I think it's also maybe a little misguided. Um, so, I, I understand wanting to talk about it and, and, and wanting to think about it, um, but it, it's kind of a weird thing to lead with. Um, yeah. But other than that, I, I think it's, it was an interesting conference and it was interesting to see people getting together and um, hopefully nothing, nothing bad comes of it. Um, 
but yeah, it's, it's good to see things are slowly coming back to normal. Hopefully um, next year will be better. Yeah, no, I agree. And uh, next year, the event will move back to Austin. So um, it was in Austin for two years. It's been in Denver for two years now, and it's going to flip back to my hometown of Austin. So that'll be an easy event for me to attend. But let's move to your first topic this week. And you want to talk about mid-band battles continuing between AT&T and T-Mobile. Yeah, so as you know, AT&T and Verizon both spent a lot of money on mid-band. Um, and one of those reasons is because T-Mobile acquired Sprint and acquired on average 160 megahertz of mid-band spectrum. Um, and as we've been reporting over the last few months, they've already managed to significantly improve their holdings uh, um, in terms of mid-band and by acquiring some more C-band, which will come down the road, but also by, also by having their network roll out and just rolling out and making use of that mid band and it's showing in their in their their average speeds mm -hmm. um and they're actually crushing the competition uh when it comes to that by um really just deploying it quickly and, and getting it out there and making sure devices are able to use it and it's showing in the numbers and i think they're gonna they're gonna have that leap for the foreseeable future and because of that i think we're seeing at&t starting to be more vocal on the fact that they don't think uh you know T-Mobile should necessarily have more mid-band um, because both at and and Verizon are kind of in a uh, follower position here. Um, but I do think it's an interesting argument. Um, and I think it's very, it's, it's somewhat entertaining just because at and and Verizon have enjoyed um, spectrum holding advantages on T-Mobile for the last decade or so. Yeah. Um, so it's very, fat, it's very interesting to hear the opposite argument being used now. Um, although I will say I don't recall T-Mobile ever arguing that AT&T and Verizon have too much spectrum. Right. So um, I think, if anything, this shows that the competition is working um, and that T-Mobile is driving some form of competition in the market, perhaps too much. Um, but I, I do think that we should still be considerate of AT&T's position in that uh, we don't want anyone necessarily holding too much of any spectrum because ultimately competition is still good and we don't necessarily want that pendulum to swing way too hard the other way. So yeah. um, I think there's some validity to at and argument, but it's also um, maybe a little bit uh, of an argument that I don't think anyone would have ever expected at and to be making uh, 10 years ago. Yeah, no, I agree. And just, you know, a little bit of color on that. So I mentioned Neville Ray uh, participated in um, the big 5G event. And he, he participated virtually and he spoke to two things I'd like to mention. One, um, you know, he always likes to, you know, to, to talk about, you know, all the achievements that, that they're making and, and getting 5G deployed. He pointed to um, a stat that says that they, they anticipate having 200 million, you know, folks covered with 5G by the end of 2021. Um, that's sort of in line with what AT&T has been reporting as well. And so that, that's impressive. He also spoke to the recent data breach, and um, I think, I don't believe we've addressed that on, on prior podcasts, but I've been providing commentary with journalists as well as on Twitter, and he did mention that um, the company is working with KPMG, their security practice, and a company called Mandiant uh, to bolster their cybersecurity provisions. They're off, also offering customers uh, two years of identity protection as well, and you know, if I look at, you know, some of the, um, uh, you know, the, the communication that was coming from CEO Mike Siebert, you know, uh, this past week, um, they're just trying to be very transparent about it. And, you know, these threat actors are becoming more and more sophisticated. I think there were a lot of my colleagues um, that were uh, quick to jump on T-Mobile before the dust had settled. And um, I think it, as we see now, the, the, the breach wasn't as broad as people initially anticipated, but still there were you know, quite a few customers that were exposed. Um, T-Mobile contends that you know, no financial information exposed, but personal identifiable information, which is not a good thing. So you know, I do believe that this will be you know, um, you know, sort of a, a watershed event uh, for not only T-Mobile, but for other operators you know, such as AT&T and Verizon and others around the world to really take an inventory and stock on what they're doing to safeguard, um, you know, data and privacy. 
and especially for those European operators that uh, have to conform to GDPR, um, the penalties are quite significant. If you look at you know some of the billions of dollars and and, and fines that have been levied on the likes of Google and whatnot. So um, I think the silver lining in all of that is that um, you know there's going to be better scrutiny and better better protection on these service provider networks moving forward. But let me move to my second topic this week. And I want to talk about Open RAN. And so initially it was Nokia, and then eventually Ericsson came out. And what both infrastructure providers are stating is that they are pausing their participation in the ORAN alliance based on the concern of three Chinese companies that are a part of the ORAN um, initiative uh, in building you know, and developing the standards for the next uh, you know, uh, generation uh, radio access network solution. So, I, you know, I don't believe this is like a permanent, you know, thing. I, I believe it's a temporary pause, but but certainly, you know, one of the biggest concerns, obviously, well, there there there've been two really, you know, motivating factors behind ORAN. One is domesticating cellular infrastructure supply chain. Um, I don't think um, Open RAN is going to have a huge impact on 5G deployment. It will on some greenfield um, deployments, like with Dish. And when you look at other parts of the world, like in India and that sort of thing that are potentially greenfield, but on, you know, the majority of networks are, are existing. Um, those commitments have been made on deployment. I mean, Ericsson has locked up a lot of wins. Samsung, as we've spoken to um, on prior podcasts, um, has been locking, you know, a lot of wins up as well as Nokia. So, you know, you know, at the end of the day, I think this is a temporary pause, but in the whole geopolitical environment, um, it's interesting. So any any comments on your part? Yeah, I, I think um, I think it's interesting because they're clearly making this much more of a visible issue. Um, I think they wanna they wanna improve um, relationships with these companies because they are contributors, um, but they're not gonna be able to benefit from their contributions. So Right. Um, I think it's good that, you know, these companies are standing up for their partners um, and maybe risking some um, monetary benefit from it as well. But ultimately, these kinds of consortiums and partnerships uh, um, like ORAN are, are important to have companies standing up for each other. Um, and I, I think it's temporary, like you said, yeah. um, but I do think these entity listings are making uh, collaboration more difficult. And ultimately, I think it's important that we consider that if we don't kind of mitigate some of these things, we could have a Chinese 6G standard. Um, mm -hmm. And that might actually be very bad for the industry because then, you know, device manufacturers are going to have to be able to build devices that adhere to both standards. Mm -hmm. And um, some of those things might not even be compatible, um, right. you know, across networks and across um, countries. So I, I, I'm very worried about what this potential bifurcation of 6G could be um, because, you know, 5G is actually the first time we've had everybody coalesce around one standard. Mm -hmm. Because with 4G, you know, we had uh, WiMAX trying, you know, early on. Right. Um, right. And that failed, but it, it still took some resources away from Ford, from uh, LTE. So 5G is really the first time we've had you know, everybody on the same board. Um, and I really worry that, that 6G might be the time that, that that splits out again. And I don't think it's for the best for anyone, honestly, other than maybe a few um, vendors here or there that, that might maybe have some lobbyists that are pushing for this. But uh, we really need to, to, to step back and look and make sure that we don't push um, the Chinese government to uh, a point where they can justify mandating, uh, a, you know, a, a Chinese 6G standard. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And then, you know, the, the, the effect of all this on the supply chain and semiconductor has tremendous ripple effects, but those are some great insights, but let's move to your second topic this week. And you want to talk about AT&T and their plans to sunset their 3G uh, network. Yeah, so as you know, uh, pretty much every carrier has plans to sunset their 3G networks um, over the next year or so, um, and all of them are getting crap for it. Um, and AT&T is getting uh, some crap for it as well, of course, um, from the alarm industry. 
Um, the alarm industry says that you know AT and T uh, is jeopardizing their 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 businesses and their security um, and their safety. But the reality is is that you know they've had a long time um, to make this transition, and um, one of the early uh, complaints was that uh, AT and T wasn't giving them enough time um, because of COVID, because you know they need to do some rip and replaces. Um, but AT&T came back and said, hey, you know, you guys actually had a record year. And um, although you initially did have some issues with installations, you, you know, had more installations than ever. So um, the reason why this is happening is because AT&T needs to free up some spectrum mm -hmm. on 850 megahertz band, which is their coverage band. Yeah. Um, so it's extremely important to them to, for, for improving um, uplink specifically. Um, because uplink is what's most important for coverage. And in order to have uplink, you need to have spectrum. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> the, the thing is, is that uh, because AT&T is a GSM network, their UMTS requires five megahertz slices, while Verizon's CDMA and they only use 1.5 megahertz. So they can get away with, you know, slicing off less of their network towards 3G and still, you know, offering a very small slice. Yeah. Um, but Unfortunately, at and doesn't have that luxury, so they're just going to have to shut down 3G on 850. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the way things are going, it, it, you know, sunsetting a, a 3G network isn't outrageous um, yeah. when you consider so much of these new operators' networks are already transitioning away from 4G towards 5G. So the idea that that 3G, um, you know, needs to uh, outlive um, the other two isn't necessarily justified. And the reality is there are lots of IoT opportunities in 4G and 5G, albeit more expensive, um, yeah. but they exist. So uh, I think this comes down to a cost thing more than anything. Um, yeah. And, and unfortunately. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting to think about the traditional security alarm market and all the inroads that, you know, you know, solutions like Simply Safe and Ring have made uh, to make DIY security affordable. Um, I have a Ring security system in my home. It was $250 and it has integrated 4G um, cellular backup because whenever I have a power surge, you know, it, it sort of sends me the note there. And so, so I get it. I, I imagine that that alarm industry is sort of old school and they've probably been slow um, to move and adopt and have modularity so that they can you know, potentially upgrade a security system um, with a 4G module for, you know, for backup. But, you know, the reality is, yeah, I mean, you know, one market isn't going to dictate, you know, an AT&T, you know, decision, you know, whether to sunset something or not. But, but it does bring up some interesting, you know, um, decision points and, and concerns, but uh, good stuff, man. Well, let's move to my third and final topic this week. And, um, I want to talk about uh, Bharti uh, Airtel in India. And, you know, I've, I've talked about this on prior podcasts. I've been very vocal on social media about my concern around government entities and the spiraling cost of spectrum and, and how that really puts operators in a, a very um, odd position with respect to having to not only pay for spectrum, but invest those billions of dollars and euros in, in infrastructure to get these mobile and fixed networks deployed. And so Airtel this week discussed uh, their plans to raise almost 3 billion equivalent US dollars to um, basically be prepared for um, the auctions that I believe you've spoken to on a prior podcast that are coming up. And again, you know, what are the long-term ramifications? especially for a country like India, that's a developing country now, their economy is growing by leaps and bounds. Um, obviously, when you, when you look at the news and you look at you know, GDP and, and that sort of thing, but it's also um, a nation that doesn't have the same um, standard of living and wealth that other parts of the world have. And so you know, with, with Airtel having this you know, go through, it's a very unique um, sort of equity um, transaction that requires, you know, uh, the Indian stock exchanges to be involved as well. I mean, again, this just creates, you know, a, a pretty substantial expense for, for really for a country where, you know, operators are going to be struggling just to get, you know, um, the, the actual physical infrastructure deployed. So what are your thoughts? Um, 
I mean, we've seen this happen in the U.S., right? Yeah. We've seen a lot in of Europe. the uh, a lot of the U.S. operators kind of come out with financing rounds um, and and raises to ensure that they have enough capital to um, bid effectively on auctions. Um, so I think this is a this is a uh, you know a natural move, but it is also a signal that you know Airtel does plan to. Um, spend a, a considerable amount of money on Spectrum, um, and that they, you know, they want to be competitive with, you know, the geos of, of India um, mm -hmm. and the Vodafones to be able to make sure that they get enough Spectrum to be competitive um, as 5G rolls out. So I, I think this is a good thing for them, and um, we'll probably see more of these coming soon as as the uh, the auctions come up soon. I agree. Well, let's move to your third and final topic this week. And you want to talk about Deutsche Telekom and Vodafone and a partnership with BMW. Yeah. So um, this week, basically at the same time, both Vodafone and Deutsche Telekom made an announcement they would be partnering with BMW and their new iX vehicle, um, which is um, their new generation um, of electric vehicles. Um, and this vehicle has 5G connectivity. Um, and what they're doing is uh, both of them are going to be enabling a, a personal eSIM, um, which basically allows um, the user to uh, enable 5G connectivity in their phone um, and, and to do it very easily and, and hopefully cheaply um, and to basically link their personal eSIM to their BMW ID. Um, so it can be used in any eSIM enabled vehicle, hmm. uh, which is interesting. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting use case because it, it doesn't necessarily tie um, the uh, connectivity to a physical SIM anymore, right? Because we have eSIM yeah. and it now it ties it to something that's BMW related, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because both Vodafone and Deutsche Telekom made an announcement claiming to be the first, but they're both the first at the same time. So <laughs> I don't know, maybe they tied for first. Right. Um, but uh, it's interesting nonetheless, because we're starting to see more 5G connectivity in phones and now we're seeing in cars. So, so uh, I was gonna ask you, so is the use case infotainment, like, you know, streaming video and audio, um, I'm not a, I, I don't imagine it's to support some level of autonomy in the vehicles, is it? Or am I wrong? Not yet. This is a uh, call telephony application as well as um, for Wi-Fi hotspots, um, as well as for, you know, streaming traffic uh, and, and other services. So um, this is kind of like a way of up-leveling the existing connected car experience. I currently have a Tesla and, you know, 4G connectivity is nice, um, yeah. but you can tell that there's some limitations with it. Um, and I have a feeling that there's a, you know, there's a QOS cap on, on what I can really access in the car. So right. um, it, it's gonna be interesting to see what the 5G experience is like compared to 4G. Um, but you know, not even many people have 4G in their cars. And for the most part, it's being used yeah. for OTA updates, which is funny because a lot of cars that have cellular today for OTA are still not actually using cellular for OTA. Like mine, for example, I still have to connect to Wi-Fi to get most OTA updates. Interesting. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about over-the-air updates and that sort of thing. And yeah, I would imagine, you know, with a 5G link, I mean, faster, cheaper? <laughs> Maybe not cheaper, but definitely faster, right? Yeah. But that, that's, that's kind of it. It's, it's, uh, it's just interesting because, you know, eSIM is enabling these new... Um, applications and i mean this car isn't even out yet it's supposed to come out in november yeah um so it, it's 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 very clearly this is a ground setting um announcement for uh, a new new phase of bmw who who has desperately desperately needed to catch up to their competitors in terms mm -hmm. of technological uh capabilities both on electrification as well as just enabling new and unique features so yeah. Um, I think we're starting to see a new phase um, in BMW's um, history. And, you know, they've got both of the big German um, operators right behind them. Yeah, I, I would, I would argue, well, not, I wouldn't argue. I, look, my insight would be that this is a great application for eSIM, right? 
And, you know, eSIM has been very slow to be adopted by the operators, you know, in traditional devices, just because they, you know, you know, they monetize that, you know, that pop and, you know, you know, from a provisioning standpoint, it would be easier, but I, I think there's been some concern on the operator's part that they're going to miss out on some level of optimus, you know, kind of monetization if, yeah. you know, they, they moved wholesale to eSIM, but, but like in my iPhone 12, um, I have eSIM support, I have AT&T and I've actually got, you know, you know, I've got a, a number coded to the eSIM and a, and a physical SIM in the, in the phone. So, I think we're going to see a lot more um, eSIM adoption, and this is a great use case. And I agree with you that, just from my perspective, is kind of a, a car car nut that um, that BMW's been a little bit behind the game relative to their competitors, and this should help really kind of up level what they're doing there. But hey, it was another great podcast this week, buddy. Why don't you take us home? Absolutely. We hope our viewers and listeners found this week's topics interesting. If anyone out there would like to reach out to us to provide insights on a specific 5G topic for a future podcast, please reach out to us on social media. Will is at Whale Tech and I'm at Anshal Sog. We hope you have a great weekend and please tune in again next week.